Thank you, Ben. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks to the organizers of this event. I hear it's 21 years now, which is really impressive. And a lovely, lovely town. I've been walking around the town and really enjoying it. You have lovely, clean, fresh air. I live in Los Angeles. So you can imagine. And there you are what you breathe, right? So I thank you all for being here and taking care of your own health. Uh, I'm going to talk about, I'll tell you what I'm going to talk about, but I'll first I'll give you a little bit of background about me. I have a clinical practice. I've written a number of books. I do lectures. I do a lot of media, a lot of television. A former assistant clinical professor at UCLA School of Medicine. Uh, I've done some TV. Uh, and including the Dr. Oz show, which I think he's made a really good contribution to people understanding more about their own health and The View and other TV shows. And I'm on a number of boards and an author of a number of books, including Natural Highs, Eight Weeks to Vibrant Health, Supplement Your Prescription, and The Addicted Brain and How to Break Free. I want to talk a little bit just, just about like kind of where I'm coming from in terms of how I approach healthcare because it's different from how other doctors do. First of all, I think the healing power of nature is the best healer, and that's where the food comes in. So what I do is I help to identify and treat the root cause, not the symptoms. So I don't just throw medicine at people, but I actually try to identify, you know, looking under the hood and seeing what's really going on, and then treating as naturally and safely as possible, not using chemical drugs, and being as non-invasive as I can, and I really do partner with my patients because you know your body better than I do. I'm a consultant. I'm a consultant to your body and your health, but you're the one who, I actually, who actually has to eat the food, take the supplements, do the exercise, and give, give me a good history. <laughs> and I treat the whole person because we really do live in a whole, you know, this mind, body, spirit, environment, family. There's so much that goes into who we are. And as a physician and healer, I have to attend to all of those in a, in a person. Also, I believe a lot in prevention. Let's not wait till somebody's totally, like, really sick before you do something about it. I have to laugh, and it's not, not even funny, but I've had patients come to me who said they saw their doctor who said, well, your, your blood sugar is borderline high. Let's just watch and wait. No, no, I'd say better change your diet so you don't become diabetic. Like, duh. Anyway, that's where I'm coming from. So we don't, wanna, we don't want to have chronic diseases. We want to be able to prevent them, and they are preventable. So what we do is we assess the risk factors and do something about them. Like I just said, about if somebody's pre-diabetic, change their diet. So your health is very much affected by the food that you eat, by your body chemistry, by your hormones, by the environment that you live in. And this is such a beautiful environment here that you really are blessed to be breathing such wonderfully clean air. And then there's specific nutrients that I will prescribe and that you, even without a prescription, without having a doctor tell you, there are things that I'm going to teach you today, that you'll, and in my books as well, that help you to choose the right nutrients that you particularly need. Because, you know, food is information. Food carries with it messages to all the different parts of your body, including turning on and off your genes. So we think, oh, it's genetic, you know, by family is, they're alcoholics, they're diabetic, um, cancer runs in the family. You know, so people think it's inevitable, like Angelina Jolie with, with, who had the gene for breast cancer. Well, sh you can turn off that gene with the right nutrients, with the right herbs and supplements. You really can. And conventional medicine just doesn't get it. There's a huge field, it's really good science, called epigenetics. So just know you are in control of your genes. You may have been given a certain, you know, dealt a certain deck, but you don't have to play that hand. And what I'm going to talk about today is the nutrients as messengers and how the different nutrients affect different aspects of our health, how the toxins interfere, the issue of GMO, how the GMOs affect our health. I know it's a huge issue right now, and what action you can take. And the action is actually sprinkled throughout my whole talk. Now, I actually give, there are many talks I could give right now, including food and the brain. I'm going to mix that in a little bit, but for more information on food and the brain, uh, probably the best place to go is my website. To, and my website is on the bottom of all the slides. 
um, cleverly put down there so you can't forget it. You have to notice it, CassMD.com, because I can only do so much in the what, 45 minutes to an hour that I have here, and I'm very grateful to have this time with you. So let's start off with, hey, why eat Whole Foods? Because your grandma said? Well, maybe, maybe she was right. But Whole Foods have more vitamins and minerals in them. Here are some of the things that happen, for example, when you refine flour. You lose, look at the, look what you lose, 77% of thiamine, which is needed for mental health. By the way, when, when people go into DTs from alcoholism, they go into DTs, which they can die from, give them a shot of thiamine, and they totally get out of the DTs. Very, very important vitamin. All these vitamins have very important roles in our health. So if you are eating refined flour, you don't have enough thiamine in your body. Riboflavin it removes 80%. 81% of niacin, again, extremely important. Do you know that in the 1950s, Dr. Abram Hoffer was treating, ni was treating schizophrenics with niacin? And it's still valid. I mean, schizophrenia has not changed since then. So I actually give high doses of niacin to schizophrenic patients, and it works very, very well. So what I'm saying is that our food is so depleted that we're having more of these chronic diseases showing up. And we have ways to fix that, which is to not eat refined flour. And you can just go through that whole list, folic acid, pantothenate, vitamin E, betaine, choline. So it's not like you have to memorize this list, but the, the takeaway is how many vitamins are removed when you refine flour. And you also lose minerals. That should say loss of minerals in refining flour. Magnesium, calcium, potassium, chromium, manganese, iron, copper, zinc, selenium, absolutely essential for attention, mood, to prevent cancer. Selenium and zinc are very important for cancer. Zinc is important for mood and attention. Um, on and on, chromium for balancing your blood sugar. And each of these has many, many roles. We know about ma magnesium and calcium for bone health. So all of these, very, very necessary. So we don't want to eat refined foods, we want whole foods. And then we need fiber. You know, we keep hearing, eat fiber, eat fiber. Why should we eat fiber? I'll tell you why we should eat fiber. We should eat fiber because, first of all, it changes the gut flora. You know, we have friendly bacteria in our gut. And they, they're very important, these good bugs. They are friendly bacteria and we feed them with dietary fiber. And if we don't have enough dietary fiber, these poor bugs are not going to be too healthy. And then the bad bugs will take over. So we want to have, we want to feed our our healthy bugs so that we stay healthy. They're called probiotics. It also, the dietary fiber binds toxins uh, through the bile salts, which is put up by the liver. Dietary fiber affects absorption of carbs and micronutrients. Somebody's having a party over there. Um, possibly prevents hemorrhoids and varicose veins, diverticular disease, hiatal hernia, and all kinds of digestive intestinal problems that we have that are called the diseases of civilization. And then there are all these chemicals that are in food, and you don't have to pronounce them, you don't have to spell them, you just have to know that there is a huge list. Have a look at this list here. These are very, very important for everything that happens in our body, and these are found in fruits and vegetables. Flavonoids, polyphenols, indoles, oligosaccharides, saponins, sulfuric acid, peptides, on and on. And again, the take home here is we need chemicals. These are good chemicals. We need the natural chemicals that are in plants to make us healthy. We, we evolved along with the plants and they are, we are part of nature. And if we don't have these as part of nature, as part of our nature, as part of our body, we're not gonna be functioning well. So when you have whole grains, they're full of vitamins and minerals, all those vitamins and minerals that I said, essential fatty acids, that fiber that I mentioned that keeps your digestion healthy. And when you eat whole grains, you have less risk of diabetes, stroke, heart disease, and increased longevity. You'll live longer. Anybody here want to live longer? I think so. It also in, in, improves your blood sugar. Um, you get beans or legumes improves your blood sugar, lowers your serum cholesterol, and it forms a complete protein when you combine them with grain. So beans are actually protein. And then there are all the vegetables that are full of vitamins, minerals, essential fatty acids, carotenoids, again, fiber. I keep mentioning fiber, you gotta have fiber. 
And again, people who eat a lot of vegetables have reduced risk of heart disease, cancer, and many other diseases. And you know that the Cancer Society, American Cancer Society, recommends uh, five servings of fruits and vegetables every day. So they finally caught on too. So it's not just about treating cancer after the fact. But people who do eat a lot of fruits and vegetables have a far lower incidence of cancer. And I'm actually gonna talk about some specifics as well. The cruciferous vegetables, the brassica vegetables are particularly cancer protective. Broccoli, all those ones that have kind of that smell or taste, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, cauliflower, turnips, kale, collard, radish, they're a little strong, but the, the, those are the things in them that actually help to prevent cancer. So if you're worried about cancer, don't go have preventive surgery, please. Eat cruciferous vegetables. And then there are more sophisticated things too. If you really are high risk for cancer, there are other, many, many other herbs that you can take that are specific. Onion, the good old onion. I mean, we just take it for granted. We just eat onions, we put it in our salad, we cook with it, have it on our hamburger. Source of quercetin, it helps lower blood pressure. It's a natural blood thinner. It prevents atherosclerosis, lowers, and it lowers blood glucose or blood sugar in diabetics. So just the lowly onion has a tremendous amount of medicinal effect. Tomatoes, how do you like that? Tomatoes contain lycopene, and lycopene has been shown to be really very helpful in treating prostate problems, including even prostate cancer. It's also good for blood pressure and for blood thinning. Spinach, well, Popeye had a secret. Popeye knew what to do. He, except he used to eat it from a can. I didn't quite understand that. Maybe spinach only came in cans in those days. Remember, he would eat his spinach and get really strong. Anyway, it uh, reduces the risk of age-related macular degeneration. That's something that people get that causes blindness. And it helps to increase the excretion of something called oxalates in the urine. Again, you don't have to know the details. You just need to know that if you like spinach, it's a good thing. And if you don't like it, eat it anyway. So we like, and then this fruit. So those were all the vegetables. Eating fruits, again, high in potassium, vitamin C, and other nutrients that we need a lot. Fiber, there's great fiber. So don't eat just the, don't drink the fruit juice. Eat the whole fruit, because when you're, Drinking fruit juice, you're just getting a whole bunch of sugar. And if you eat it with, with the whole fruit, it absorbs more slowly. You're not getting such a sugar rush. And all the good nutrients are absorbed more slowly, so you get more from it. And again, it's associated with, risk, uh, with, with reduced risk of heart disease, cancer, stroke, and osteoporosis. Blueberries, we've been hearing a lot about the health effects of blueberries. They have pro anthocyanidins in them, and we know that they actually help to, uh, they do a lot of things. They play a lot of role in tissue integrity, longevity. It shows that people who eat a lot of blueberries can actually, it actually increases their lifespan. And it also is really good for urinary tract infections, just like cranberry. I mean, we hear a lot about cranberry for urinary tract infections. They help, the cranberry actually helps from the bacteria from adhering to the wall of the urinary bladder and it also helps by your, uh, acidifying the urine. So it may sound like, well, who needs that? But if you have a urinary tract infection, you're real happy to have cranberry juice. A lot of, lot of happy ladies. Also eliminates a typical schizophrenic body odor. So we know that schizophrenia is actually a chemical uh, imbalance, and it's not a deficiency in antipsychotic medication. You know, There actually is a chemical imbalance that we can do something about. So even just showing that the cranberry helps uh, eliminate the odor says something. Uh, and it's high in oxalate, which sometimes forms kidney stones, but in this case it actually helps to protect against kidney stones. Now olives, who'd have thought that olives have, I mean olives, we just like eating them, right? But olives actually have a lot of really good chemicals in them. And you can see all of those. I'm not going to spell them out for you. But they also inhibit platelet aggregation. They, they're blood thinners and they help with lowering LDL, which is the bad cholesterol. And it has an effect like an, an uh, ibuprofen, anti-inflammatory. So when you think of the Mediterranean diet, which is very healthy, you know, Mediterranean people really live long and have lower incidence of heart attacks. It's because, you know, part, in part because they're eating olives and olive oil. And pref preferably eat extra virgin olive oil. 
because it's been extracted without the solvents and it has still has all the goodness in it, has all these preserved good chemicals which are taken out with the solvents in the refined olive oil. So always have extra virgin olive oil. It has nothing to do with its sex life. So just you should know. Um, next is nuts. Eat them raw. They contain protein, essential fatty acids, fiber, magnesium, arginine. Very, very nutritious. They're not fattening even though they contain fat. They can help actually lower serum cholesterol. They can help lower blood pressure. And they're associated with the risk of lowered cardiovascular disease or heart disease, lower diabetes. And as I said, they don't make you fat even though they have fat in them. And then meat, a preferably grass-fed meat if you're eating grass-fed beef rather than corn-fed. And we know the corn is GMO, so we really do not want to eat corn-fed beef. So meat provides protein, iron, and other minerals, B vitamins, carnitine, cholesterol, and saturated fat. We do need cholesterol. Cholesterol is not the enemy. Anybody here think cholesterol is bad? It's not. We need cholesterol to make our hormones. We need cholesterol to make our brain cells. So uh, this whole thing about cholesterol being bad for you is just not true. Uh, you have to be careful. This is Memorial Day weekend. A lot of you are barbecuing. Trim the fat off because when the fat drips down and is burned in the, in the flame, you, gases come up that cause um, ages or carcinogens. So trim the fat and also uh, don't use a really, really high flame. Another way to avoid a lot of exposure to barbecue, because barbecue is good, you know, and it's, it's not bad for you if you do it the right way. You may want to pre-cook the meat somewhat, so then you get the final touch on the barbecue, so you get the barbecue taste, but it hasn't been on the barbecue that long, so that you'll be so exposed. You know what's interesting is my dad was a physician, he was a pathologist, and before that he was a family practitioner, but he used to always say, don't barbecue because it has, it's carcinogenic. And this was, I can't even tell you how many years ago, I won't say. But he, he was on to that. So, uh, and that's, by the way, how I became a doctor. My dad was a family practitioner, practiced out of the house. And I just thought it was the neatest thing in the world to be a doctor. I mean, people would come in looking really unhappy and sick, and they'd leave feeling, you know, the smile on their face. I said, hey, I can do that. I want to do that. And I did. And he encouraged me, which was really nice, because in, in the time that I went into medical school, not a lot of women were doing that. So that was, that was very cool. I'm very, very happy that I became a physician. Um, they don't teach nutrition in medical school, by the way. I had to learn all this on my own. So next is fish. Eat fish, it's good for you. Protein, omega-3 fatty acids, and other nutrients reduces the risk of cardiovascular disease, probably because of the essential fatty acids. And um, eat smaller fish, because when you eat the bigger fish, they've eaten, they've eaten all the smaller fish and all the way up the, the ladder. When you get to a really big fish like tuna, see tuna isn't really these little things in a can. I mean, they are huge fish. And they are high up on the food chain. Swordfish is big, high up on the food chain, high in mercury. So it's really important to keep your mercury level down. So be careful about eating fish, preferably smaller ones like trout perch, um, sardines, and so on, anchovies. Now dairy is interesting because we're, we're taught drink your milk, protein, calcium, vitamin D, and other nutrients. But a lot of people are allergic to it, and a lot of people, by the way, type 1 diabetes is often due to an allergy or an autoimmune reaction to dairy. So you need to be aware of that. It may also provoke, provoke, uh, promote cardiovascular disease. So milk is not essential. There's other sources of calcium. In fact, there's a lot of calcium in spinach. Maybe that's why Popeye was so strong. So um, milk is not my favorite. And by the time you get the pasteurized milk, all the real goodness has been pasteurized out of it. Raw milk is another story, but there are a lot of regulations around raw milk. And the authorities tend to come after people who sell raw milk, uh, although it has a lot of its of enzymes in it still, and a lot of the vitamins and minerals that are taken out with pasteurization. So you really have to know if you do it from a clean farm, from clean cows, it can be very healthy. Eggs are good. So they were given a bad rap by this whole anti-cholesterol thing, but the truth is, it really doesn't affect people's cholesterol. Most people can eat a couple of eggs a day, 
no effect on their cholesterol. And they're really healthy for you. They have all kinds of good things. If you think about this, it's a chicken, and it's a little chick that hasn't been born yet, and all the food that's there to help it grow into a chicken. I mean, that's, that's a lot of nutrition there. So if we can eat nice fresh eggs, preferably nice fresh eggs from the farm, we're gonna have some very good, healthy food right there, really good protein. Uh, when you scramble it, you cause oxidation. So I remember I told you earlier, like when you barbecue and you cause these, uh, this oxidation or these ages, as they're called, advanced glycation end products. Anyway, so scrambling eggs does that, so it's better to have them if you can, poached or soft boiled, or hard boiled. Uh, next, I want to talk about toxic contaminants, the things to look for to avoid. Aspartame, anybody here drink diet sodas? Or eat, put equal into their coffee or tea? Okay, aspartame is what's in those, it's an artificial sweetener and it's pretty toxic. It can make people kind of crazy. You know, you actually have, I've had people very agitated, very anxious, couldn't sleep, and it turned out it was from, the, from drinking a lot of diet sodas. And when they stopped the diet sodas, to which they were addicted, that's a big addiction, they got better. MSG, monosodium glutamate. Um, you get what's called the Chinese, um, Chinese food syndrome from MSG. It's a preservative, it's, it's not good, it's a food additive that's supposed to enhance flavors, but it's not particularly healthy for you. So avoid it when you can. Heavy metals, and I'll talk about them in more detail in, in uh, another slide, in the next one. And watch out for the agricultural chemicals. I know that's a big issue here, we're in an agricultural area, and uh, you want to avoid pesticides, herbicides, ripening regulators, hormones, and antibiotics, all of which have, are involved in agriculture the antibiotics with um, the livestock. And endocrine disruptors you need to avoid, like plastics and pesticides. Uh, Nick, I'm gonna mention, I mentioned the heavy metals, and it's not about heavy metal bands either, it's like about metals, real metals. You can get lead from water pipes, uh, and, and contamination from industry will enter the food chain too, so you may not have lead in your water pipes, but it can get into the food chain and you're ingesting it anyway. Aluminum, you can get them from can, cans, the lining of cans, from tinfoil, from cookware, from municipal water supplies. You've got to watch out for aluminum. It's been thought to be a factor in Alzheimer's. Mercury, tin, and cadmium, too. So I, I find many patients contaminated with heavy metals, and they've had brain problems for a long time, memory problems, mood problems, and when we remove the heavy metals with a special process called chelation, they get better. So that's an important thing to watch for. So this is really kind of a potpourri. I'm really touching on everything here, and I don't expect you to remember it, but it's just to tell you that you need to eat the good stuff and avoid the bad stuff. And in agriculture, the pesticides and herbicides can cause cancer, diabetes, infertility, and Parkinson's. We're pretty sure that Parkinson's is due to heavy pesticide exposure. And when we look at the Parkinson's patients, we find that they have had, very often have had pesticide exposure. Uh, if you're exposed to hormones from livestock, or you're eating the hormones that they were fed, it can make you susceptible to, to cancer. And antibiotics, if you, if you eat the antibiotics that the animals were fed, then you're gonna develop resistance. You're gonna develop resistance, so when you need an antibiotic for something really serious, it's gonna, the bug will be resistant to the antibiotic because you've already had so many antibiotics in you. So that's another issue. Plastics. We don't like plastics. It seems to be the sixth food group, but it's not funny. So these endocrine disruptors, they actually really interfere with your hormones. Are leaching out of the plastic bottles. And you know, you know, you've read these things about Coke and Pepsi, how acidic they are and how they leach the plastic. I mean, water, just having water in plastic bottles will leach the plastic, but these acidic uh, drinks are even worse, and so you're basically drinking a lot of plastic. You're drinking phthalate esters, uh, penonal, phenol, bisphenol A. They finally removed that from baby bottles. Can you imagine that was only five years ago? Babies were given, I can't believe this, were given formula, or even if they were breastfed and the mom pumped, the, the baby bottles had bisphenol A in them, and then they'd be put in the microwave to reheat 
which meant the bisphenol came out even more in the milk. So we're exposing infants to a load that the little bodies can't really handle. So these are all these are all the things we really you know it's kind of sad news. I'm the bearer of really bad news here. You know, talking about all the bad stuff in the environment, but hey, you might as well know. And the, the, all these bad things, the endocrine disruptors, like the aspartame in the Diet Coke, the, the tin can, the plastic, cause cancer, diabetes, sperm abnormalities, infertility, miscarriages, autoimmune disease, uh, premature breast development. We have a lot of premature puberty. A lot of little girls developing early because of the hormones that are, this is really bad, hormones in the meat, but also hormones in the water supply. Because just think of this, all these women taking hormones, and what happens, they pee it out in the water and it goes into the water supply. The water supply gets purified, but not completely. And a lot of, a lot of drugs remain in the water. Hey, we can get more Prozac from the water than from a prescription. So like, not a good idea. And the bisphenol A I was mentioning from baby bottles can also be causing diabetes. They showed when an experiment with mice that they were able to cause diabetes by giving them bisphenol A. It's poor little mice. Uh, and it, it, it leaches from the inner surface of the food and beverage cans and from the polycarbonate plastic containers. So you want to have the containers that have the triangle on the bottom that don't have bisphenol A in them. And there was an NHANE study on herbicides and pesticides that has showed a strong correlation between serum con concentrations of what are called POPs, persistent organic pollutants, which are really pesticides and herbicides that stay in your body, and the prevalence of type 2 diabetes. So in the areas of the country where there are a lot of pesticides and herbicides, really like in the Midwest and the prairies, really higher incidence of diabetes and obesity due to the POPs pesticides and herbicides producing persistent organic pollutants. So this is a big story. I mean, each of these things I'm talking about is a story in and of itself, and I'm having to go through it really quickly, but I figured I need to give you an overview of all this, so you'll know how to explore further on your own. And I'll give you some resources on how to look more deeply. Uh, the next thing I'm gonna address is GMOs, and I'm not sure that anybody else here is going to be doing that, so I wanted to make sure that I covered it. Um, they are a, a bad story. And uh, these slides are courtesy of Jeff Smith from the Institute for Responsible Technology, who's a, uh, a good friend and colleague and has been doing a great deal uh, in the movement for uh, non-GMOs. And we have some really serious health risks, uh, which he wrote about in uh, health risks of genetically engineered foods and also in seeds of deception. So everything I'm talking about here you can get in his books. Now, this is the, some bad news, which you probably know. 94% of our soy is genetically modified. So you really need to, really need to avoid most soy products. Corn, 88%. Cotton, 93%. Canola oil, which is from Canadian, from, it's Canadian which is why it's canola, it's Canadian, um, Canadian something oil. Anyway, 90% of it is GMO. Sugar beets, 95%. Alfalfa uh, has, has GMO in it too. And the, the story with GMO, and I'm not gonna go into all the science because you can actually read up on it in his books, but basically what you're doing is they isolate a gene with a desired trait, they change the gene so it'll work in plants, then they prepare the plant and they take that gene and they inject it into the plant. So the plant becomes genetically modified. It becomes a different plant. And they, they grow that and then that becomes part of the new seeds. And then what we're actually ingesting, that seed grows up into a plant and we eat it, and that becomes part of our DNA. That is scary. So let's say they do antibiotic resistant genes. So, you know, it sounds like a good idea, but how would you like to have antibiotic resistance in you? When you need an antibiotic, it's not going to work because you have antibiotic resistant genes in you. Uh, not healthy. Uh, and the, the, initially, the FDA was actually warning, sci the scientists actually warned that these GMOs were going to cause more allergy, toxins, new diseases, and all kinds of nutritional problems. 
and they, the scientists said, hey, we need some long-term studies here. We can't just put this out on the market. And what happened? They were overruled. Now, who overruled? Who overruled the FDA scientists? What a surprise. Michael Taylor, in charge of FDA policy, former Monsanto attorney, later Monsanto vice president, now U.S. food safety czar. Is this the fox guarding the hen house? This is really scary. This is really scary. So, based on the safety nutritional set assessment, this is basically what the FDA said about Monsanto. That, that basically if Monsanto says it's okay, it's okay. That's, that's the sum total of, of that little meaningless um, note there. The FDA says the Monsanto has concluded that its GM products are safe. So they're okay. They get the stamp of approval. So moving right along, the very first, first GMO crop was flavor saver tomato. Now that sounds yummy, flavor saver tomato. It sounds kind of cute. Well, what happened? The rats refused to eat it. See, the rats are smarter than we are. I have to say that. And in fact, a lot of animals, a lot of animals won't eat GMO feed. They just avoid it. They won't touch it. These include geese, squirrels, elk, deer, raccoons, buffalo, mice, rats. Um, and one farmer was talking about how his Squirrels were avoiding GMO nuts. So you really need to pay attention to this. If the animals won't eat it, then there's something wrong. And one farmer, this is an interesting story. A farmer actually bought two big bags of corn. He was gonna do an experiment himself. And he bought a bag of corn that was GMO and one that was non-GMO and stuck them in his barn over the winter and forgot about them because he was gonna do a little experiment and he kind of didn't get around to it. Well, in the spring he was cleaning up in the barn and oh, there's, there's my corn. And what happened? The corn on the left was all eaten up. That was the yummy, normal corn. The corn on the right was the GMO corn. So those little mice may have been hungry, but they weren't gonna eat any of that stuff. So what does that tell us? And then they actually had force fed some rats because these rats would not ordinarily eat the stuff. But after 28 days, seven out of 20 rats developed stomach lesions. Another seven of the 40 died within two weeks. This is serious. So what, the, what does this do? The, the GMO changes DNA, which changes RNA, which changes the whole structure of people's cells. Uh, BT is what we, what's been put in the crops to make them Roundup resistant. Do you know about the Roundup resistant? Okay, so that's been put in corn, and it has a, it's known, known to be allergenic. The mice that were fed BT corn, again, they're force-fed, had all kinds of trouble with their immune system. And then uh, there was another experiment done in Austria where it increased infertility and low birth weight. By the way, we are having a lot of infertility and a lot of low birth weight. Have you noticed? I've noticed as a physician a lot more infertility than we've ever had before. And the corn, the, the rats that ate the BT corn after 90 days had liver and kidney problems, blood pressure problems, allergies, infections, all kinds of, all kinds of things, high blood sugar, anemia. Uh, and this, by the way, this was a Monsanto study, but they don't publicize that. Then there's the BT cotton, which has, was used in India, and people were getting allergic reactions. The workers that were working with the cotton got these terrible itchy rashes uh, that they, there was really no treatment for. And the sheep, thousands of sheep died after grazing on BT cotton plants. We're eating GMO food. I mean, I hate to scare you. I don't want to be the bearer of bad news. We're not eating the cotton, thank goodness. But these poor sheep did, and they died. Um, and then the, the um, Andhra Pradesh government in India advised farmers not to allow animals to graze on the BT cotton fields after four institutes reported the presence of toxins in them. So in India, they're actually doing research, and they're showing that, in fact, this stuff is toxic. And these poor animals also had serious skin problems. And uh, three sheep in each group um, showed reduction in, in their food. They were swelling, they had swollen lips, nasal discharge, swollen heads, fevers, 
and uh, they all died within a month, okay? The BT corn killed them. The Indian buffaloes, this is very sad because you know, India is a poor country. And when they lose their animals, it's their livelihood. So first of all, the buffaloes most refused to eat the BT corn seed and oil cakes. And they had some very, very serious medical problems, skin problems, and sudden death. These are buffalo. They had grazed on the BT cotton plants. Uh, if they did it for one day, they became sick, sick and unconscious in two or three days. 13 of them died in this particular experiment. And, or in, in this, it wasn't an experiment, it was just what happened. And then it, it showed here these poor dead water buffalo, and they're very important to the economy and to these people's livelihood. And when they had postmortems, this is kind of yucky, like bloody, yucky postmortem, but um, that's the bad news. Holes in the lungs and their livers were darker, flattened, and dry. They had really sick livers and sick lungs. And they also found undigested food in the rumen, in their stomach, that undigested food, which means it really affects the probiotics. Remember I mentioned those healthy bacteria, those good bacteria that help us? Well, that actually killed them. So uh, the BT farmers, this is very sad, the BT farmers had a very high incidence of suicides, and that was because they had to buy the seed. They were no longer allowed to use normal seed that they had been carrying over for generations. They had to buy the Monsanto seed. And in order to buy the Monsanto seed, they went into hawk. And a lot of them could not pay back. They went to serious debt, they couldn't pay it back, and they committed suicide. 125,000 suicides of farmers who could not pay back Monsanto. This is on top of all the damage done by the GMO food to their animals, and of course to them. And to the people who were breathing it, sneezing, asthma, coughs, nosebleeds, swelling, fever, headache, stomach ache, dizziness, diarrhea, vomiting, weakness, numbness. Hey, this kind of sounds like a drug ad, doesn't it? You know, when somebody doesn't have that, all these things and death. Uh, and after consuming the corn, nine horses, four buffalo, and 37 chickens died, and five unexplained human deaths. So we have deaths all the time, and we don't know what they're from. We say, oh, it's a heart attack, or we don't know why they died. But hey, this, this is, could be a contribution. In 2011, BT was found in the blood of Canadian women and in their fetuses. This is scary, and it damages human, human cells. Chicken-fed liberty-linked corn, which is GMO corn, died at twice the rate. So we are really, this is, this is so serious. Um, again, hate to be the bearer of bad news, but this is just what's happening. And right now, we, we don't have any real post-marketing surveillance. You know, there's no, there's no real follow-up. The stuff's being put out and no one's, no one, there's no human clinical triers, trials, no proper evaluation of the plant changes or the effects on the plants. And the approvals are based on disproved or untested assumptions. You know, right, way back when those scientists said, no, we don't have enough proof here. And the FDA just said, oh no, it's okay. We can, you can, you know, they're acceptable, which is really awful. Now, Monsanto had this plan in 1999. They had a meeting with Arthur Anderson, big marketing consultants, and they resolved that in 15 to 20 years, Monsanto would rule the seed world. They would rule the agricultural world. That was in 99. So they're doing, you know, they're kind of on schedule, aren't they? But we, we really have to do something to stop it. Um, just the other day, there was a GMO bill uh, in the federal government, in the Senate, that was voted, uh, it, the GMO labeling bill was voted down 71 to 27, because Monsanto has a, some, a very heavy lobby. If anyone wants more detail on that, there was an article in the Huffington Post, it was out today or yesterday, uh, by Michael McAuliffe. So you can get that website down or you can email me at my website and I'll pass this on to you. So what do we do? How do we stop the genetic engineering in our food supply? You know, they were able to stop it in Europe. In Europe, they had Unilever, McDonald's, Nestle, Burger King, and Safeway all removed GMOs because people objected. It's the power of the people. When people said, we are not gonna patronize your companies, we're not gonna buy your food, that 
made a difference. And that's what we have to do. We have to raise awareness. And I, I was really happy to see, I was driving here to the high school, and there was a group of people chanting and carrying signs, uh, GMO signs, non-GMO signs. And I actually stopped. And I just said, hey, guys, you're doing great. And I really support you. And you know, keep it up. I was very moved to see them. I also invited them to our talk. But here we are. So, uh, but they're doing, they were doing good out there. So, because the, the, the point is the awareness in the US is actually kind of low. A lot of people just don't know about it. Some people, 60% don't know at all. Uh, uh, people don't know that they've eaten GMO food. 60% of people don't know that they've eaten GMO food. 15% said they don't know. 25% say, yeah, we know, we have eaten it. So that's some awareness. And what we have to do is really tip the scales. And that can happen pretty soon. We did this with, with bovine growth hormone. And this is a real interesting situation. Um, bovine growth hormone in milk was actually um, voted down. Uh, the Walmart, well, we, it still exists, but, but Walmart, Kroger, Starbucks, and 58 of the top 100 dairies have stopped using bovine growth hormone. So you have to be careful when you're buying dairy products that it doesn't have that in it. You don't want to be eating hormones. Heavens, I mean, to feed our kids hormones, like milk's good for you, but we're feeding them hormones, really bad. And then General Mills announced that they were committed to making YoPlay yogurt products 100% free of milk from cows treated with bovine growth hormone by August of 2009. That was, that was good. Now, YoPlay also has a lot of sugar in it, and I can't say like it's the best yogurt in the world, but hey, at least it doesn't have bovine growth hormone in it. So here are some things we can do. The Institute for Responsible Technology, which is easy to remember, responsibletechnology.org. That's a good website, a good resource. They did a, um, they're quoting a survey here, this is from their website, that the third fastest growing health claim for all brands is GMO free. So we're making some inroads. I'm saying we because I assume that all of us here are on the non-GMO side, yes? yes? Yes, I see a lot of nods, okay. School meals under intense scrutiny, removing junk foods, and I know that's going on in Truckee, and I really congratulate you for all the work you're doing for organics and what you're doing in your school and for the school lunches. We have to protect our kids, and we have to educate our kids as to what's good for them, what they should be eating, and showing them how to grow their own food. Uh, and the American Academy of Environmental Medicine made a really good statement saying that animal studies show that there's a serious health risk, including infertility, immune dysregulation, accelerated aging, and et cetera. Big, big, long list of disruptions and very serious, very serious health conditions that are shown, absolutely shown to be a result of GMO food. Now, as shoppers, we can make choices. Okay, 28 million adults are high usage organic buyers, 54 million are temperate organic shoppers. So they're not as religious about it, they're not as conscientious about it, they do it when they can. Uh, there's also a shopping guide, the non-GMO shopping guide, are you familiar with it? You can get this, some of the stores have it, or you can send away to, uh, there's a website, we just pick it up on the website, non-gmoshoppingguide.com non-gmoshoppingguide.com, or you can go to um, Responsible Technology that I mentioned and pick up the, their work, and this, was, this is Jeff Smith's Seeds of Deception, excellent book, Scientists Under Attack, Genetic Roulette, which is a film, uh, and quite a bit on there that you just have to go to the, web, the website which is responsibletechnology.org, responsibletechnology.org, and pick up a whole lot of really good material. Everything I talked about here about GMOs is on that site. Uh, and then I want to put this in a bit of perspective because we've talked about the GMO aspects, but I really want to just also emphasize, put this in the whole perspective of shopping the periphery of the supermarket. Growing your own is even better. Buy organic, grow organically, because organic it has to be non-GMO. And then raw or lightly cooked vegetables and fruits because the goodness, the enzymes are there when they're raw. Whole grains, not refined flour or sugar. And low glycemic carbs. Low glycemic are the unrefined um, carbs, the whole grains. 
eat fish, not farmed fish. Farmed fish is usually um, treated with antibiotics, pesticides, hormones, bad stuff. So you want to eat really good quality fish, meat, chicken, grass-fed meat, lean meat, omega-3 eggs. So here you're getting your eggs and your omega-3 at the same time. That's a good combination. And the oils. I always say dressing on the side because so many places, so many restaurants kind of load you up with too much oil. Too much of a good thing is still too much of a good thing. Virgin olive oil and balsamic vinegar are probably the best things for salad dressing. Drink green tea and water rather than some of the other drinks that we mentioned earlier, like the diet drinks that contain aspartame. Uh, limit your dairy, eat low fat, and if you're gonna have dairy, eat yogurt, but have yogurt that doesn't have sugar in it. Yogurt itself has a really good taste. Yummy, actually. These are a couple of my books, Natural Highs and Eight Weeks to Vibrant Health. Uh, I think I have, I have a few copies of Eight Weeks to Vibrant Health that I brought with me. And uh, I just want to finish by saying this is for our children. And these are my grandchildren. So I'm doing this for them because I want them to grow up in a world where they can feel safe, where they can eat the food and live a good, long life, a good, long, healthy life. And to get in touch with me, I'm easy to get in touch with uh, at my website, cassmd.com, and I welcome uh, correspondence. I do answer email. Uh, it may take a while, but I answer it, or you can get me on Facebook. And if you want, you can sign up on my website. There's a little, go to my website, cassmd.com, and on the upper right-hand side, there's an opt-in where you can put in your name and your email address and you get a free ebook called Reclaim Your Brain. And it's all about brain chemistry and how you can affect your brain chemistry by what you eat and then by very specific nutritional supplements. And I didn't talk too much about that today because we had all this other stuff to cover.